Our gospel reading for this morning is from Matthew 28. This will be a familiar passage, I think, for many of you. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is God's word to us this morning. I invite you to be seated. That passage, Matthew 28, is one of the best known Bible verses, especially it comes up whenever people talk about missions, right? I mean, if you ever go to a missions workshop or event, you ever hear a preacher talking about missions. He, they always zoom in on this passage because this is the big hurrah. This is the final chapter of Matthew's gospel after Jesus has done all his teaching and done all the miracles and he's died and risen again and he's about to ascend and then he gathers the disciples together and says, this is it. Go. Go and make disciples of all nations. And then the book ends. It's a cliffhanger ending. It's a tune in next season to find out what happens next, except in Matthew's gospel, there is no next season, so we don't know what happens. Do they do it? Do they go off? It said some of them doubted. Do they all start to doubt? Do they accomplish the mission? How does this all end? It doesn't tell us, but if we continue on in the gospels or in the New Testament, we get to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we hear about the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, just like Jesus said that it would. And all of a sudden, these 11 disciples that are huddled together and afraid of the Jews pour out into the streets and start preaching in all these different languages, languages they didn't even know, and telling the world around them, hey, Jesus really is the Son of God. He really is who he said he is. And thousands of people start to believe in Jesus every single day, it seems. I want to fast forward now to chapter 8 of Acts, and it starts with these words. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. On that day, which raises the question, what day? Wednesday? Someone's birthday? What day exactly are we talking about? We're talking about that day, that same day that Stephen, a follower of Jesus, was martyred. That day where Stephen was killed in the streets. Stephen, we don't really hear much about him except the Bible tells us that he was full of grace and that he was doing these uh, signs of mighty wonders and people were drawn to Stephen and uh, the Jewish leaders didn't like that. So they call Stephen in and they start to question him, asking him by what authority or power he's doing these things. And so he starts way back with Abraham and he goes through the Old Testament telling them all about how God has sent all these people and these prophets and they've always rejected them. And now they've done it again with Jesus. He says, you've done it again. Now you've gone ahead and killed Jesus. It's this amazing sermon. If you want to read a great sermon after you're done here, Acts chapter 7, phenomenal sermon, this great message by Stephen. So good, in fact, that all the people hate it. They take off their coats, they pick up stones, and they kill them right there in the street. Any of you bring stones with you this morning? No, I'm thankful for that. Fascinating, isn't it? On that day, it says they take off their coats, they pick up stones, and they kill him right there on the spot. It says that all the disciples are scattered. Just the apostles stay in Jerusalem to keep building up the church there, but everyone else runs. They flee. It is get out of town immediately time. Why does all of that happen? Any blamers here? Any finger pointers? You won't raise your hand but you're thinking of someone else you think is a blamer and a finger pointer. If you were a finger pointer, maybe you'd be pointing your finger at Stephen right here. This is Stephen's fault. If he hadn't given that blasted sermon in the street, none of us would be in trouble. We wouldn't have to pack up our things. We wouldn't have to leave our jobs and our families. It's all Stephen's fault. So it would make sense if the next verses after that, after the death of Stephen, were a bunch of people ranting and raving, saying, that crummy Stephen never liked him in the first place. But that's not what they say. The next verse says this, Godly men buried Stephen and mourned for him deeply. They loved Stephen. They cared about Stephen. He was a faithful guy. He was being faithful to Jesus. It didn't turn out the way that they would have liked, but they still honor him. Even though everyone has to flee the city of Jerusalem, they still believe he was just being a faithful, Jesus-loving guy 
And so they honor him. It says this next, that the persecution keeps building. In verse 3, but Saul began to destroy the church. Those are ominous words, aren't they? To destroy the church. What is the church? The people, right? They don't have any buildings. They don't own any property. Saul starts to destroy the church by wiping out people. It says this, going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So the question now is, who is Saul? When they kill Stephen, it says that they take out their outer cloaks and lay them at the feet of a man named Saul. Why do they take off their coats? So they can throw a bit faster? So they don't get blood splattered on their clothes? For either of those reasons, they take their coats off and they lay them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Why? Because Saul is one of the leaders leading the charge against the Christian church. Saul tells us that he is, in his own words, that he is the most Jewish guy you will ever meet. This, this is him speaking about himself. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. It's quite an introduction, isn't it? That is the equivalent 2,000 years ago of a mic drop, right? Bong! It's a slam dunk. It's a ba-dum boom It's a, can anyone here compete with me on that? No. Saul says, I'm as Jewish as you get. I'm as religious as you get, as strict as you get. And because he thinks Christianity is a sect, a cult, a heresy, he is there to wipe it out. And he's doing that, believing that he's being faithful to God the whole time. So he wants to destroy the church. He does it by going door to door, finding out who the Christians are, and either having them arrested or having them killed. Have you ever felt persecuted because you're a Christian before? I have a little bit. Maybe you have too. Not to rank persecutions, but let's do it anyway. My, my experience of persecution, if there's a sliding scale, is something like this. Like I showed up at a party with my Michael W. Smith cassette, and people thought it was lame, right? Or I said, hey, anyone want to watch VeggieTales? And they said, VeggieTales is dumb. Anyone experience uh, anything like that, persecution like that? Yeah, a couple of you. Or maybe you said, hey, you want to go to church? And they said, yeah, right, when I'm dead, maybe. I think that's kind of the persecution we experience. These people experience a different type of persecution. When there's a party of people knocking at your door, not to hang out with you, but to kill you, that's a different level of persecution. When they're dragging you by your feet out of your home, that's a different level of persecution. When you're fleeing for your life, that's a different level of persecution. On the scale of persecutions, I think many of us have probably experienced more over here than we have over here. It's really gut check time for the early church. Are they going to keep following Jesus or not? It'd be a lot easier not to. They start dragging you out of your house and say, hold on, Jesus, no, I don't follow him. I follow the Yahweh, right? Yahweh, everyone likes Yahweh? I like Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh. It'd be really easy. It'd be super easy to turn and abandon your faith. It'd be way easier to just say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore than it would be to pack up your house and move your family to another place. I couldn't find who the author was, but I found these words that I thought were pretty significant. They wrote this. There's a strange thing that happens when the church undergoes persecution and trials. One might initially think that when threats are made and imprisonment carried out, the church would be silenced and run for cover. What happens, however, is the opposite. Rather than running for cover, the church becomes bold and willing to suffer all losses for the sake of her Lord Jesus Christ. When the church becomes persecuted, that's when it becomes bold. That's when it becomes filled with courage and starts speaking out to the world around us. And that's what we see in the next verse of Acts chapter 8. It says this, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Can you imagine having to flee from your home because people want to arrest you or kill you? And what you do is as you scatter, you go and tell more people. You get more excited about the gospel. You become more passionate about preaching it and telling these people as you go about Jesus. Well, that's exactly what happens. And it's fantastic. 
It's fantastic because in chapter 1 of Acts, Jesus says these words. Part of, some of them are actually on our new banner. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Then we skip part on our banner. But it says, you will be my witnesses where? In all Judea and Samaria. When the church scatters in chapter 8, where do they scatter to? Judea and Samaria. Just as Jesus had said, I'm sending you to these places, now they're sent. Now off they go, telling people as they go. There's a strange thing that author wrote, that when the church undergoes persecution, then it becomes really bold about preaching and speaking about Jesus. There's another strange thing that happens, it's the exact opposite, that when the church experiences great peace and prosperity, it becomes quiet and often lazy. Have you ever seen those two things at work? I mean, think about the church in China as it has to go underground and it spreads like wildfire. And think about the church in Canada as we have great freedom and peace and prosperity. We kind of get quieter and quieter and quieter. This past week, my whole family was in Quinell. We had a great vacation. Met lots of you asked. We went to Panorama and uh, hung out with all of Miranda's family, which was really great. And then we went to Quinell and hung out with all of my family. That was really great. And we were on a lake there, a 10-mile lake. And my family grew up doing a ton of fishing. We fished all the time. So as we got together, this was the mission. Catch some fish. What was the mission? Catch some fish. We wanted to catch some fish, right? So every day we were talking about fishing and if we're going to go to a different lake or just stay at 10 Mile Lake and what those all going to look like. And there was a variation of boats there. My dad has a 14-foot aluminum boat. My brother-in-law has a, a Sea-Doo ski boat. Uh, and then I'll just show you what my family brought. I won't bring the whole trailer in. I think I can get it in here. This is the Team Weems fishing boat. This is beautiful. Watch it on the back. There we go. This is the Team Weems inflatable kayak. Pretty nice, isn't it? Think about this for a minute. Can anyone see any problems or concerns with putting my family of five into this boat and trying to catch some fish? Any initial thoughts come to mind? Just imagine, there was never five of us in here, but there was three or four at a time. So one of the rules in an inflatable kayak is, of course, don't tip the boat, right? I mean, that's a good one. Another one is, uh, when you're fishing, and you got all your hooks out, is don't pop the boat, right? Because <laughs> you don't want to pop it. Then another one is, if you're casting, don't hit anyone else in the boat. I'm not going to cast it here. I also don't have a hook on so those are some of the rules. And then a couple other things came up. For example, some days it was windy and rainy, and this in the wind just really goes for it. And if there's waves, this just really rides the waves like nobody's business. So there's lots to talk about. Keep the boat steady, right? Don't tip the boat. Uh, another thing that came up is some days we just wanted to go uh, dirt biking, or some days we wanted to go um, tubing behind a faster boat. I can only paddle so fast in this. Um, and then... Um, then a question came up, what would we actually do if we caught a fish? Like, how would we kill the fish? Would we bang it against the, the padded, cushiony sides, right? That would, anyway, guess how many fish the Weems family caught on this most recent trip? Any guesses? You guys have so little faith in me as a fisherman. <laughs> no, we caught zero. You're right, but still, your guesses, your guesses are kind of hurtful. You know, it's interesting, I think in North America, the church has largely become concerned about not rocking the boat, right? We've got a mission. What's the mission? Catch some fish. But we're mostly concerned with don't rock the boat. There's waves coming. There's turbulence coming. Don't rock the boat. Right? We want to just keep the boat steady. Some of you are 50 or 60 or maybe even 70 years old. Do you feel like society's changed at all in the last 70 years? Yeah, maybe a little bit. In the last 40 years? Anyone seen any changes in the last 20 years? Last five years? I think the rate of change has increased drastically. It's speeding up more and more, faster and faster, away from Christianity and Christian beliefs. And I think what the church is largely doing is saying, shh, don't rock the boat. Don't say anything. 
Don't be like Stephen and get us all in trouble. Just keep it quiet. And the more and more things change, the more and more we get worried about just keeping everything steady. So we're just kind of spreading ourselves out and laying low until we pretty much just disappear. <laughs> right? And we kind of become, kind of just disappear and become irrelevant and unnoticeable and keep on declining. How would anyone join a church if the church has nothing to say anymore? And we just keep on saying to each other, shh, don't rock the boat. Don't mess anything up. And we keep praying to God, God, please don't rock the boat. Please don't let anything happen to us. And do you know what I think God is saying? I'm the one rocking the boat. Can you think of any times in the Bible where God rocked the boat? Heard of a guy named Jonah? Who rocked the boat? God rocked the boat, right? Or can you think about any times where the disciples got into a boat with Jesus? Jesus plus the disciples in a boat means that the boat is going to be rocking, right? They cry out to Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die in this boat? I think sometimes God rocks the boat. Here's another example. All the disciples are in Jerusalem, and it's getting comfy there, and it's getting peaceful there. And I don't think that God sent people to kill Stephen, but I think he used that to rock the boat too. I kind of wonder if things had just stayed comfy and cozy if they would have just stayed in Jerusalem. But instead, something, someone, maybe God himself rocks the boat and off they go to the places where he was sending them in the very first place anyway. And I think sometimes we spend so much time saying, God, please don't rock the boat. Please don't change anything in my life. Please just let me stay comfortable and cozy in my warm little safe bubble. I think sometimes God is rocking the boat saying, why are you in a bubble why are you safe and comfortable and cozy? Didn't I send you out to Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth? And so sometimes God is the one who rocks the boat. So we'd go and follow after him and be faithful to him. I want to read what happens next in Acts chapter 8. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Wouldn't it be amazing if wherever Christians went, there was just great joy in that city? Great joy because the, Christian, the Christians are here! The Christians have showed up! I mean, do people ever do that when you roll into a town? Hey, the Christians are here! This is going to be great! Maybe because they don't know we're there. Maybe because we're so quiet in our own little churches that no one ever knows. I mean, does Cloverdale even know anymore that there's this little church called Hillside? I hope so. I hope that God is continuing to rock the boat here so that we look for new opportunities and to see where God is leading us and what he's calling us to do. The New Testament changes significantly at Acts chapter 8. Through the Gospels, it's all about Jesus. And then in Acts, it becomes about ministry right there in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 8, the whole rest of the New Testament is about the church scattered. Where they went, who they went to, what they preached, what they taught them, the theology, the questions that they had, the letters they sent to encourage them and to direct them and lead them and help them build up one another in faith. It all becomes about being the church scattered scattered, gathering more people into the body of Christ. It's pretty significant. Chapter 7, Stephen dies. Chapter 8, the church goes. What was the mission? Catch some fish, right? What was the mission? Yes, you at home, I hope you're saying it too. You know, that's the very first mission that Jesus gave to the disciples in the first place. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus, if you're going to follow me, Jesus says, at the very outset, if you're going to follow me, this is what I'm going to do to you. And this is what you're going to do. I'm going to make you fishers of men, and you're going to fish. You're going to catch people. You're going to stop paddling around in the lake in your inflatable kayak, and you're going to go start living out lives as fishermen and fisherwomen, bringing people into the kingdom of God. 
That was the first mission that Jesus gave, the first announcement he gave to those disciples. And it continues to be the mission of the church today. It continues to be the mission of Hillside Christian Church today. Our mission statement is to see people connected to Jesus, hooked on Jesus, caught up with Jesus, those people that are right here in this room, but then also that we would go out and continue gathering other people up into this incredible kingdom. Why? So they could experience grace and transformation as we all follow him together. That's the mission of this church. That's the mission that we believe God has given to all of his church. Think with me for a second about the Old Testament, about Joseph. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? He's his father's favorite son, and he is, he's got this beautiful coat, technicolor dream coat that his father gave to him, and he's marching around telling his brothers, hey, I had another dream where you guys all bow down to me, and they hate it, of course, and hate him. They beat him up, throw him in a well, sell him into slavery. Off he goes to Egypt. In Egypt, he starts to rise, gets some promotions, rises up the ranks, and in the end is able to save countless lives because he's faithful to God and faithful to who God has called him to be. And eventually, one day, those brothers come knocking at his door because of a famine in the land. Do you remember those incredible words that he speaks to them? Let me read these for you. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. When it looked absolute worst for Joseph, God was actually turning all of that around into something incredible, something great that he could use to save so many different people. Can you think of other times where that happens in the Bible, where something so bad ends up working out so good for all those who were impacted by it? Kind of like this story. Stephen gets killed. One Christian gets killed, and then thousands of others end up coming to faith because the church scatters and goes to tell them. God takes something that's bad and turns it into something that is incredible. Here's another example. There was a man by the name of Jesus, and he came to love, and he came to introduce the world to a God that they had never experienced in a way that they'd never understood. He came to reveal the heart of God to man. He came to save the world. And as they nail him to the cross, and as he dies there, people think, well, that didn't work. He was a failure. He was a liar. It wasn't really who he said he was. And then three days later, he rises from the grave. And God turns what they intended to be evil into something so good and beautiful and powerful for us, for the forgiveness of all of our sins and for eternal life for all those who believe in him. So it shouldn't surprise us, I don't think, in our own lives, where we experience shakiness, where the boat rocks, where there's difficulties or challenges. We shouldn't say, God, you've abandoned me. We should instead maybe be saying, God, what are you saying to me? And where are you sending me? Because we believe in a good God who's powerful and who has a mission, a mission to save the world through his son, Jesus And now we are those ambassadors. We're those witnesses who have been sent out by Jesus as his representatives to the world. What's the mission? What's the mission? So let's go and do that in the power of Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for this day and I give you thanks that you are a powerful God and that you can turn even the worst circumstances into good for your glory and for the benefit of your people. God, as we hear about the church being transformed through a time of persecution, God, we don't pray for persecution, but we do pray that we would be faithful to you right now. And God, as our culture changes, I pray that we would find our voice, that we would be filled with power, just like those disciples were 2,000 years ago, that we know that the Holy Spirit has come upon us, that he's filled us up, that he's uh, welcomed us in baptism into your family, and now he lives in us. So we pray that you would now speak through us. And God, we know that there's been times where we've been unfaithful to you, where we've uh, shrunk away from persecution or awkwardness or... Uh, just uncomfortability, but Lord, we ask that you would help us to stand up, just like Stephen did, just like your church did as they spread out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God, you've brought us here to Cloverdale at this time and this place to Surrey and Langley and White Rock and Delta and all those other areas that we're from. God, we pray that as we go back home that people would rejoice because we bring grace and truth to them. 
But even if they don't, Lord, help us to be faithful. Even if they don't receive us well, even if they're not thankful to see us, even if they reject us, even if they persecute us, that we just continue being faithful to you. And that we know that that's the most important thing. Lord, we pray that as we go, as we scatter now, leaving this sanctuary, this place of safety, as we scatter out into the world, that we realize that we're on mission, that you are sending us out, that you gather us, and now you send us. And so I pray that you would give us the words to say, the eyes to see the opportunity, hearts of boldness and courage that are set on fire by you to speak words of life and grace and truth. Lord, we pray for all those uh, people here from Hillside who haven't been able to worship with us. Lord, we pray that you'd begin drawing your people back. Um, And if there's not some reason they need to be home, if they're not in a high-risk category, but if they're just hesitant for whatever reason, or if they've drifted a little bit, Lord, we pray that you would bring them back to worship with your body, the church. And Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to be... um, creative in ways that we find solutions to make sure that people can be here and that it can be uh, safe. Lord, we believe that it's safer here than the grocery store or at work or anywhere else, but we pray that you just put a hedge of protection around this church and around the school and around the manor. We pray for parents and students as teachers as we head into the last kind of four or five weeks before school starts. We just pray for uh, all the schools around us, that school would be a safe place to come and that the right protocols would be in place. And we thank you for our teachers who just invest so much time and energy into educating that you'd also be with them as they also look for creative ways to make it uh, incredibly safe for our children. Lord, for everything else in our hearts and minds, we commit those things to you. And Lord, we give you thanks for your church around the world. And we know that lots of your children around the world face incredible persecution, incredible suffering because they claim to be your children and they trust in you. So we pray that you'd give them great encouragement and great support and great strength of faith. For everything else, for those who are grieving, for those who are mourning, for those who are struggling with loneliness or depression or mental illness, we commit them to you knowing that you're good and that you love them. And together we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.